Okay, so hi everyone. Um, thank you for joining us, and uh, good good evening, good afternoon, good morning, wherever in the world you are you are joining us from. Uh, Podchat Live episode seventy eight. We're really excited and, and and very pleased that we are being joined by Paul Ingram from his home in Vancouver, calendar, uh, Canada. Thank you for joining us, Paul. Um, by way of brief introduction for those of you who may not know of him, he uh, he used to be a massage therapist. He he deregistered. Oh, Oh, you like right, Craig? Yes, yeah, sorry, I just had some feedback. It's fixed now. Okay. Uh, so Paul used to be a massage therapist, um, but he deregistered uh, due to, in his words, not my words, uh, the overall pseudoscientific character of massage therapy, which we may get into a bit later perhaps, um, moved into creating his website, painscience.com, which we will of course put a link to below. Um, it gets over 1 million page views um, per month. And I really, I really don't want to sleep on just how how good this website is, and I mean this genuinely. Um, I very rarely look at a website uh, with any kind of envy whatsoever, um, you know, because comparison is the thief of of joy and all of those kind of things. <laughs> but but I, I, I look at Paul's, and every time I've looked at Paul's for the last couple of years, uh, I, I just wish it was mine. I wish it was my website. <laughs> I wish it was my idea. The way it's written, the depth of research, the way that the references are ingrained within it, um, I urge you to go over and check it out. It's, it's insanely good. And one of his uh, posts on there on stretching, which is, I believe I'm right in saying 20,000 words long, is going to be the topic of discussion for tonight. Um, so, Paul, if you are ready to just dive straight in, because we've got so much to cover oh, yeah. in, in, in an hour, we, we'll just get cracking if, if that's okay. Sure. Yeah. Super. So anyone watching, um, if you've uh, got any questions um, as we go along, fire them, fire them in. We've got a new bit of software now, so they should arrive at the bottom of the screen. So we'll be much more slick in seeing who they're from and, and everyone can see them and read them as well. So uh, do feel free to just type in the type in the comments box on Facebook. Um, so. But let's start with a quote I pulled from your uh, website, if, if that's OK, Paul, and that because it just it just resonated with me. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, and, uh, and that is that you refer to stretching as an incredibly popular ritual with almost no measurable benefits. And it feels like there's a lot to tease out there. Uh, we want to talk about what stretching can or can't do for us. And we want to talk about the evidence base behind it. But I love the, the referral to it as being a ritual. Uh, rather than an exercise or an activity, a ritual, because we, we definitely know that humans and and, um, uh, and others sort of, uh, I've just been put off by Adam's comment now, this is new to me, one of the best, best myth-busting websites out there, and Adam's somewhat of a myth-buster himself, so that's high praise indeed. Um, we know that humans, we know that humans do, do adopt these rituals, and we know that runners or athletes uh, sometimes stretch and when you ask them why there may be different answers sometimes, you get constantly well, well yeah can we just talk <laughs> a bit about um can we just talk about the ritual that is stretching and your your yeah. sort of experience with it no it's a reflex and um, this is deeply entrenched dogma that it's an important component of fitness most people have never examined that belief and uh, they've inherited it from PE coaches, uh, from, uh, trainers, from massage therapists. They've just, it's just, they've soaked it up from the environment for 20, 30, 40 years without ever a contrary word. So it's just extremely entrenched idea and anything that is that much a part of our uh, belief system an unexamined part, uh, is bound to, to create a lot of behavior without much clear idea of why we're doing it yeah and and why do people do it you know there's a lovely breakdown of this on in your post in this and we know those of us that, that are clinicians and we, we we see athletes or patients we know that when we ask them okay why do you do it some of them do it because they believe it warms them up and if they don't do it they're more likely to get injured some of them do it because they believe it may have some influence on performance others are talking about improving flexibility some of them just say it feels good and and do feel free to call me on any that i've yeah. missed out there they do they do say it feels good but that's relatively rare uh, it's uh, almost everyone believes that they have health or fitness goals uh, for their stretching uh, but they're rarely sure what. I remember very clearly that this journey for me began talking to 
uh, my massage therapy clients and just asking them, why do you stretch? No judgment. At that time, I had a lot fewer ideas of my own to impose. I was just curious, you know, what, what motivates this behavior? And it was fascinating to watch how much people struggled with that. Uh, for the most part, people don't know why, but if you push them to try to produce a reason, you get almost always flexibility, warm up and injury prevention, prevention and treatment of soreness, treatment of sports injuries and chronic pain, and occasionally performance enhancement. Every now and then you get some version of that. Uh, almost never does someone say, I just do it because it feels good, even though that's probably the best and, uh, and main reason that people should have. Yeah. Now, I want to talk a little bit about sort of the, the evidence behind some of those things. So people do it because uh, they think it warms them up. And I want to talk about whether the science supports whether it warms them up. People do it because they will think it improves flexibility. I want to talk about whether the science tells us that. But before we do, another quote from your website, because I loved it. And I just want to talk about, you know, not just why we do it, but whether it's having any effect or, or whether we are indeed able to stretch certain structures mm -hmm. that we, we are in the ritual of stretching. Lovely quote from your website. Forgive me while I glance down and read it. Um, whatever it can do for us, and obviously that's the bit we want to try and debate, it, it has to do within the constraints of our own anatomy, like a suntan lotion that we can't apply to our own back. Oh, that's a beautiful, <laughs> and you, you know, and anyone that's read your site knows that you're full of these, uh, you're full of these lovely, uh, these lovely uh, sort of, uh, you're a bit of a wordsmith. But um, could you just talk to us a bit about what you mean in, in that comment? Yeah, sure. Uh, this is a, this is a little, um, soapbox of mine that I particularly like that I've never really heard anyone else talk about. Uh, so I can, you know, I can claim that it's, uh, it's my idea. I call uh, a bunch of muscles in the body, the unstretchables, because they're just biomechanically awkward to apply a decent amount of mechanical tension to. And uh, another analogy that I like to use is that it's, uh, it's pretty much the same idea as you can't turn your neck um, 180 degrees like an owl. We're built the way we're built and some muscles are just hard to pull on they're just literally awkward in some cases they're downright impossible you can elongate them but elongation isn't a stretch for us to consider it a stretch it has to feel like a stretch it has to feel like a satisfying even a strong amount of tension on the muscle and there are some muscles in the body that you can't do that with in the same sense that you're not now all and you can't turn your neck 180 degrees. Uh, some of these are, are pretty straightforward and others are, are kind of mind blowers for people. And uh, the classic example that really trips people up is the quadriceps. Um, and it's because it's a complicated example because when we stretch the quadriceps, some of it is very stretchable. So your classic runner stretch where you pull the ankle up behind up to your butt um, while you're standing, uh, that's going to put a good strong stretch on the rectus femoris. That's one part of the quads, but less than a quarter. Although the quads are four muscles in one, the rectus femoris is the smallest by mass. Uh, that's the one you're feeling. That's the one you're yanking on. That's where the real tension is. The rest of it is amazingly unstretched. The rest of the bulk of the quadriceps group is barely touched by that stretch. Elongated, yes, but mostly because of tissue approximation, because your calf hits your hamstrings before the bulk of the quadriceps is strongly stretched. It's just, it's just as far as it goes. You can lengthen it, but you can't powerfully stretch most of the quadriceps. So all those people who are out there doing that stretch, they're imagining hoping for benefits from that action, from that behavior, from that exercise, without realizing that for the most part, they're not actually doing what they think they're doing. So even if the benefits are real, they're only applying to that one portion of the quadriceps muscle. And when I talk about this, I get a lot of objections. And <laughs> believe me, I've been over them all over the years. There's nothing I haven't heard on this. So while we can debate it, um, 
this isn't a casual thought. It's not just an idea. I've I've examined the biomechanics of this very carefully over many, many years. And it's my strong belief that most of the quadriceps eh, is can't stretch them. They're unstretchable. So before I ask you what the main objections are, although I suspect I know what they are, just mm -hmm. feel like we need to take things back a step just because of a, a bit of terminology you've used here. Sure. Is it fair to say we need to delineate between what a stretch is and what the mm -hmm. feeling of tension is? And could you take us through that a little in a bit more depth? The feeling of tension. Well, that's good and vague, isn't it? Um, <laughs> <laughs> and that's part of the problem. Uh, the uh, sensations like stiffness, tension, tightness, these are not technical terms. They are subjective sensations that we apply to a variety of biological circumstances, probably. And so we tend to say, for instance, say that we feel tight if we stretch and it feels like we meet a strong amount of resistance. And if it seems that way, then we call it tightness. But of course, if you apply enough of a stretch to any muscle, no matter what its state is, sooner or later, you're going to feel like it's tight. Is this the direction you wanted to go in? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah. People are routinely stretching because of a subjective sensation of tightness or stiffness. That's very often the motive for stretching. People feel tight which is kind of interesting because the stretching creates the feeling of tightness. <laughs> but I guess the idea is after you're done, you feel less tight. That's the hope. And your, your understanding of the literature, and, you, you, and I know you've read an awful lot of it, if not all of it, um, what's, the, what's the scientific definition? Or is there a scientific definition of what, what a stretch is? Or are we just going by this subjective feeling that's very individual? Um, I, I think it's... I, I think that like pornography, we know it when we feel it, see it. It's a uh, stretch does certainly many people have attempted very precise definitions of stretch. I'm not sure there's an accepted one um, or a universal one. Uh, and you can get, it can get very hairy trying to define exactly what constitutes stretch. And a, a very strong theme in the, in the hate mail that I get about, about this article, which is Plenty. Um, <laughs> is that uh, a, a lot of a lot of people just scoff the whole thing away by saying all you're talking about is static stretching, and that's not stretching, right? A lot of people, you know, it's uh, is that the uh, no true Scotsman fallacy or a cousin of it? Uh, all of this is wrong because none of this is about real stretching. Real stretching is blank. And people fill in that blank with all kinds of things, but particularly um, PNF and and other advanced, quote unquote, advanced methods of stretching. As you pull, I'm 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 glad I'm not the only one that gets hate mail. But don't you like wearing it as a badge of honor? Oh yeah, yeah. It's, I get a lot of mileage out of that. Yeah, we just had a Simon's just asked a quick question that might pay to just pop in now. Yeah, are tightness and stiffness the same thing? Um, they're both informal terms for a subjective experience um, you can't there are technical definitions of stiffness and tightness that are used in research and mm. um, but those are not the senses in in which people normally speak of them uh, so it, it in general when people talk about stiffness or tightness it's just two different informal words for the same constellation of subjective sensations so paul we, we, we are talk, we're talking stretching and, you know, you mentioned there, you know, we often think of the good, we, let's, if we go old school, we're thinking of good old fashioned static stretching or footballers stretches, as we all the, used to call them in the UK here. And then, like yeah. you say, there's, there's newer fangled things like, like PNF, et cetera. Um, is there much to segregate them in the literature? Is the literature pretty, uh, does it come to similar conclusions regardless of the type of stretching or is, is, is you know, is it right for us to bunch them all into one and just call this episode stretching? I guess is the point I'm making. It's completely reasonable for people to wonder if different types of stretching are more effective. And, and you know, if, if we were coming, you know, at this cold, none of us knew anything about stretching, it'd be totally reasonable to say, yeah, but if you, if you stretch like that, does that work better? Um, but in general, there is no compelling evidence that there is a superior fancy method of stretching. 
Um, I get that claim a lot. That's also another common theme in the hate mail. And, you know, there are a bunch of there are a bunch of people out there who basically run little commercial empires based on teaching a certain method of stretching. And either they or their followers are, you know, typically very passionate about it and uh, and and deeply resent the implication that their method isn't effective. Um, it, uh, oddly, that they often agree strongly with me about the article. That's the other approach. Of course, you're right about all of that, which is why everyone needs to learn our special method, uh, <laughs> because that's different. Um, I have uh, never found any compelling evidence that there is an effective special method. There could be. There could be one out there that's never been tested properly. Who knows? But I haven't seen it yet. <laughs> no, th that was my suspicion. Um, so... Let's go back to why people do this and sort of break them down, the beliefs um, that humans have when they do them. Um, firstly, we see an awful lot of people doing them. And when we ask them why, they say it's part of my warm up. And we don't you know how it became part of the warm up. Was it was it just something that was instilled at school or by a, an old athletics or football coach? But it's now part of their warm up. And they are utterly of the belief that if they if they don't stretch before they run, they, they're more likely to get injured. Or you'll see people on the forum saying, uh, every time I run, I get sore and someone says, are you stretching enough? Um, so let's talk about the belief of, of, of sort of this sure. ability for stretching to act like a warm up, but also to have these injury prevention powers. Could you speak yeah. to the evidence base and whether it is in support of that or not? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have pretty clear, um, pretty clear evidence on this and it's evidence of absence of an effect. Uh, this is not unstudied. Uh, plenty of plenty of research has been done on this and uh, I I can't cite from memory, but I know there's quite a few good citations on the topic, and they pretty much all point the, the same way. Um, that injury prevention is not a thing that pre-event stretching does. Um, if anything, there's some evidence pointing the other way, that stretching can either directly injury or possibly predispose people to injury. I don't think that there's a clear smoking gun evidence that stretching is dangerous, that it that it causes injury. But if anything, there's reasons to suspect that it might, as opposed to believing that it does prevent injury. Uh, so it's pretty it's pretty unambiguous, actually. I, I think it's uh, it's one of the clearer signals that we can get on anything in musculoskeletal medicine, which is, uh, by the way, hopelessly polluted by sloppy, crappy little studies. Uh, it's really, really hard to get a clear uh, evidence-based signal in this field. Uh, but I'd say this is one of the spots where you can. Uh, it's just, it's quite, it's quite decisive. Yeah. I just want to repeat something you said there, because I think it's important. Because a lot of the times people say, I stretch because I always have, or I stretch because it feels good. And you're telling me there's no evidence, but, but what's the harm? But what, what you sort of alluded to there is, there may be some harm it may be i hope harm isn't too strong a word but we do have some data out there mm -hmm. that that it could be harmful are we talking about to injury or to performance or both uh, i was speaking of injury but performance is also an issue there's some limited evidence that that there is a harm to performance um, we know that in some circumstances it seems like static stretching temporarily reduces maximal power output uh, that could make someone injury prone um, potentially, I doubt it's significant, but it's the point is is that if anything, there's there's an arrow pointing in the sad direction rather than the happy direction as far as injury prevention goes. Um, uh, but I think probably the most important thing is just just the the uh, the injury risk of stretching itself. People hurt themselves stretching. It's a thing. Um, the Australian ballet has quit stretching. They've eliminated that, which is, by the way, this is a trend that I'm, I'm really interested in. Uh, we're seeing more and more examples of elite athletes and athletic organizations uh, rejecting stretching and saying, you know what? Yeah, not so much. Don't need it. And the, the, the ballets are particularly concerned about injury, and they believe that they've seen a reduction in injury and no loss of performance. They're, they're dancing just as prettily as ever. And um, and yet not getting injured as much. So yeah. that's their belief, which is a very interesting contrast to the dogma. Sure. Can I, can I just clarify, Paul, when you're talking about the, the, the stretching, perhaps decreasing performance may, may, may not be affect the injury risk. Are you talking stretching as part of their training program or stretching as part of their warm up or, or both? 
Um, stretching as a as a warm up um, yeah. has particularly been studied. Its its impact on performance in runners has been studied, mm. and yeah. uh, there there are, there are a few signals that, that say yeah it might actually be a problem if anything, uh, probably mm. not a big one. And uh, and certainly I've seen you know I've seen credible uh, rebuttals from from experts saying yes if if it's happening at all it's probably not a big deal. Um, and we really don't need to be to be worrying about that. It, again, I think it's mainly just an interesting uh, indication that you know if there's if there's an any possible impact on performance, that's precisely the opposite of what we hope and expect to see. You know, people want to believe that stretching is going to make them run faster. Um, and I've seen detailed detailed rationalizations for exactly how that supposedly works. Um, there's a um, uh, there's a, a doc here in Vancouver who wrote a book about 10 years ago or something. Um, and he he's quite literally argues that by, by stretching the muscle before competing, it snaps back more powerfully to its regular length with every contraction. It's a weird rationalization. <laughs> he wrote a whole book about it. And, and the evidence points exactly the opposite direction. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I'm, um, not, I'm not going to tell anyone not to stretch because it's going to hurt their running performance. But as a as a research question, it's pretty interesting. There's some science there. So we've talked about warm up. We've talked about injury prevention, performance. You know, what's the harm? Uh, what about flexibility? First of all, mm -hmm. I guess the two two sub questions here. When we see someone that says, "I need to improve," I've been told, or I believe for whatever reason, I need to improve my flex. We see it an awful lot. You know, group of podiatrists probably watching. You've got tight calves. It's a, it's a classic. You, you, you hit your heel pain. You, you've got plantar heel pain. You've got tight calves. You've got X. You've got tight calves. Basically, everything's the fault of your tight calves. Firstly, can stretching improve the flexibility there? Is there actually going to be a change? Uh, and secondly, yeah. do we have a solid enough base that that change is something that we should be seeking anyway? Mm -hmm. uh, yes and no. <laughs> <laughs> Those are the short answers. Uh, yeah, stretching, stretching increases flexibility. It works. Uh, that's another remarkably clear signal. Most people, if they pull on a muscle enough, they're going to get more flexible. It's going to become more extensible. Um, that's quite well established. Um, but what's the point? Uh, do we care? Does it do anything that we want it to do? Uh, plantar fasciitis is a is a favorite topic of mine. I've written a, a rather beefy book about it, uh, and Back in the day, once upon a time, I believe that stretching, calf stretching in particular, was very important for plantar fasciitis, that it was actually an evidence-based treatment for plantar fasciitis. And at the time, either I wasn't that good at understanding the research or the research looked better back then than it did now because I have changed my mind. The evidence has brought me around. Um, I do not see compelling evidence-based reasons to stretch the calves for plantar fasciitis. And flexibility is the, it is the elephant in the room here. It is the big thing that people believe in. Like all this other stuff about performance and warm up and injury prevention is it's all relatively minor. Um, the, the big belief is that flexibility good. Everyone loves that idea. They just want to be flexible. Isn't flexibility great? I'm not sure that it is. <laughs> I don't know what flexibility is good for after all these years of studying it. It's still unclear that it has any intrinsic value, um, either generally or specifically. So just today, for instance, I did some work on the article, which by the way, I do constantly updating this article for 20 years now, and I added another 500 words today. And I was looking specifically at correlates between uh, flexibility and general fitness and health. And uh, there ain't any, there's just, I, you take other measures of fitness like cardiovascular endurance, strength, muscular endurance, et cetera, take any other measure. And it's got all kinds of happy correlations with measures of health and fitness lower mortality rate and things like that. And flexibility, mm, mm, big fat nothing, zip zero zilch. It's a big nothing burger. There are no clear links between being flexible and being healthy. Uh, 
So that, that big, broad claim that flexibility is an important component of fitness and health, um, how so exactly? I, I can't find much on that. There are a handful of intriguing little scraps of evidence you know, that stretching or certain kinds of stretching habits like yoga um, have some general health benefits or one particular, you know, quirky little measure like, oh, yeah, we found we found one signal that that, that looks like that's better in people who are doing this. But for the most part, nope. And then it, when you drill down into the specifics like treatments for plantar fasciitis, stretching the calves for that, it typically is the same thing. Um, I, I think... I'm gonna. I'm, I'm not gonna be able to pull this out of my brain um, on demand. But I, I think there are a couple of specific conditions where there's still some evidence-based hope uh, that stretching might actually be therapeutic. Um, but if there's any, there it's not many, and it's not super clear. And I wouldn't be shocked to see it overturned uh, in the next five years. So, not a lot of good Sorry. news there. No, absolutely. But let's let's do a quick. Let's do a quick uh, halftime half -time summary, so to speak. Um, sure, yeah. When it comes to the reasons human beings stretch, you know, their beliefs or their, their rituals, um, some of them are doing it to warm up. There are probably better ways to warm up. We'll come on to that in a second. I, I want to mm -hmm. lean back on that in a minute. Some people are doing it because of the belief that it has the ability to influence their injury risk, i.e. reduce it. And there's very little evidence to support that. Some people are doing it because there's some belief that it will boost their performance. We have evidence to the contrary. Um, some people are doing it to improve their flexibility. We know that it does improve flexibility, but the deeper question there is, does an improvement in flexibility mean anything? And in the presence of certain pathologies, it's very much one of the, the, the you know, the mainstays. Um, and that might not be as black and white as we were taught to under, undergrad either. And again, the people that are doing it because they like to do it or because it feels good or it's for mindfulness. What's the harm? We we say, well, in theory, none. But there is a maybe a, I, wouldn't, I can see a comment on the screen now from Jane doing yoga makes people feel better. What's the harm? Um, you know harm in the true sense of the word no uh, maybe not but you know there are some people that that stretching has has actually increased their injury rates is that a reasonable half-time summary yeah it seems like a reasonable half-time summary right yep. so a quick question that we talked about humans there um why do dogs and cats stretch i'm going to make the assumption that they're not doing it for or any animal i'm not going to make the assumption that when you see your dog stretch he isn't doing it because he's been told to or that he has any beliefs that it's influencing his flexibility injury rates or performance um no why, do I, what, what, why does a dog or a cat stretch well i'm going to make a, a technical distinction um what uh, what they're doing is called pendiculation not stretching uh, pendiculation is a very specific and distinctive behavior that all animals engage in um and as soon as I said that, I thought, really? All animals? Crabs? I, probably not. Probably not sea lice. Um, <laughs> all animals is a big category, but a lot of them. I, just, I think probably for sure all mammals do it. Uh, pendiculation is a, uh, a short, a quick stretch of the whole body, often with a yawn, I believe is the definition. It's not sustained. You're never going to catch your dog. Um, <laughs> doing a 90 second stretch before chasing a ball and the, the, <laughs> the sustained uh, the sustained static stretching is purely a stupid human trick uh, yeah and uh, yeah there's there as far as i know there is no consistent animal behavior of of sustained static stretching that's just not a thing they do there's no other animal no other mammal that on the planet has ever hung out for 30 seconds plus in a in an elongated <laughs> position that, that you're aware of i would <laughs> bet that some of the primates have done it at I'd some love, point I'd love, a, I'd love to see a gorilla doing a, a you know a, a gastroc stretch up against the glass of the zoo that would be incredible <laughs> um, I, I mean, actually I, yeah go ahead Greg. So, so i was going to say for you actually you just reminded me of a famous quote from percy serity who coached her herb elliott to an olympic gold medal in the 60s he's quite a famous australian coach in the 60s yeah. And one of his, he, he never got his athletes to warm up at all. Yeah. But his evidence and logic was rabbits don't warm up and they can run very fast. Yeah. <laughs> Same with cheetahs. And yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I believe there's a few, uh, there's a few comic strips out there uh, based on that oh. idea. You know, I've just seen a comment. Um, 
I've just seen a comment, Craig, from uh, Adam, if you can pull it up. And Which it's, one? Uh, dogs and cats stretch. So dogs and cats stretch so they can lick their own ass. They need to clean parts. We use flannel <laughs> for. If you could then bring up two comments before that, Steve Wells' comment, I stretch in bed when I wake up. Why? Um, mm-hmm. I, I have, I, I mean, I don't want to say anything, Steve, but, you know, um, I think Adam may have answered your question there. Maybe, maybe you know, maybe Steve is trying to reach parts that other people can't reach. I say that because I know Steve's a regular listener. So, um, right, let's get back on track. Um, there was a comment from Joe. Oh, I've lost it now. Where's it gone? It was from about Olympic lifting from Joanna. Uh, flexibility, I don't know if you could pull that one up so people can see it, Craig. Flexibility is beneficial. Um, if the movement requires it, Olympic lifting um, effectively and efficiently to hit positions. And I think Adam referred, you know, even Adam's uh, replying in the comments saying the best way to hit Olympic lifting positions isn't stretching, it's to do more Olympic lifting. I just wanted to get your your take on that, Paul. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I know, I know Adam's thinking on this and completely agree. Um, it's uh, one of the strongest arguments against stretching as a habit is that uh, it, it does increase flexibility, but we don't know if it matters. And meanwhile, there are other ways to increase flexibility. Stretching isn't the only way. Newsflash, I, this, this is a surprise to a lot of people, but you can increase flexibility brilliantly with strengthening exercises, just as long as you're strengthening um, at up to the end of your range, it will increase. Um, this is what the Australian ballet is doing. Uh, they, it's not that they dropped stretching. It's that they just said, you know what? The strengthening is good enough. That's getting us our range. And not only is it getting us range, it's getting us strength throughout our range. We're training for strength through the whole range of motion, which is precisely what you want to do. And strengthening has all kinds of very uh, well-established benefits. So get, you're looking at much better bang for your buck there. You're yeah, that's achieving that, the flexibility goal and a bunch of others at the same time. Actually, that, that's a good point because there, there's the comment people will often make, you know, stretching, what's the harm? Well, the harm is you could probably spend that time doing something that's more beneficial. Yeah. <laughs> um, more bang for the buck. Yeah. yeah. It's not it's not a huge harm, but yeah. yeah. And, you know, for the most part, the what's the harm question, I, I answer, you know, very uh, confidently, not much. There, there's not a tremendous cool. amount of harm in this particular myth. I can think of many, many other myths that are more pernicious, more serious. Uh, mm-hmm. But time wasting is the big one. I, I, I see I see a lot of people who are really, they feel bad when they don't stretch the poor buggers. It's... It's amazing how bad people will feel for not engaging in this habit. And uh, they, they truly believe that they should be doing it. And if they're not, they feel guilty about it. And just eliminating, you know, like, ain't nobody got time for that. It's <laughs> get rid of it. If there isn't a compelling reason to be spending time on something, don't. If you like it, great. And obviously yoga is the great example. A lot of people like yoga for a lot of reasons. And if you do, fantastic. Mm. Um, But if you are stretching just because you think you should, and because flexibility is an important component of fitness, which is still, by the way, the official uh, policy and recommendation of some major organizations. Mm. um, If that's why you're doing it, eh, you could probably drop it. Make space for something else in your life. Yeah. Actually, here's an interesting, interesting comment, um, Paul. It's about an asymmetry. What if um, there is an asymmetrical tightness in muscle? Is that worth stretching the other side to try and get some symmetry? So we're assuming symmetry is a good thing. Yeah, in general, if there's a, yeah, right. And, and I don't, actually. Um, almost everybody is asymmetrical to some degree. Um, and unless it's a super um, obvious asymmetry, it's probably not a problem. If it is a super obvious asymmetry, it might be pathological. Um, if it is um, obvious enough to be maybe a concern, it may or may not be fixable with um with stretching. So, you know, a, a good example of that might be, say, frozen shoulder. You know, someone has a pathological cause for a significant loss of, of range of motion uh, unilaterally. Um, sorry, I should have come up with a podiatry example, but none popped into my head. <laughs> 
Um, but good luck stretching your frozen shoulder. Good, good luck restoring that, that range of motion. That's a weird condition that is more metabolic and biological than, than mechanical. And uh, so I, I think that the circumstances where you have an asymmetry that is clinically suspicious, significant, and can actually be treated by stretching, quite rare. Um, so, you know, for instance, uh, uh, contracture um, is a pathological foreshortening of tissue and static stretching has been shown quite clearly to have basically no impact on it. You're, you're beating your head against a brick wall there. So if, yeah. if that's the case, it strikes me as generally implausible that stretching is going to be useful for any significant asymmetries. What about the, the issue of, um, say, you know, yoga type stretches as, as part of a warm up, uh, maybe in, a, in an athlete or part of their training, but it's, it's not really the stretching, it's they're just getting into a, a sort of a meditation mindfulness mm -hmm. state. And so the, so I, I'm thinking of an elite hurdler, they perhaps get in that particular stretch that they go over the hurdle, you know, they, that's yeah. going to help their visualization, you know, the, so the stretching is not necessarily benefit, but the, the, the activity that they're doing actually has benefits for in other aspects. Sure. Yeah, and, and yoga is a complex mix, right? Yeah. There's a lot going mm -hmm. on there. And, uh, you know, in, in science, we, we try to isolate variables and, and study, you know, the specific components of things rather mm -hmm. than, a, than a stew of, of variables like yoga is. And if, if an athlete has the experience that they're, you know, they're doing better after that kind of a warm up, then I'm certainly not going to tell them not to do it. <laughs> uh, but I might comment that it isn't necessarily the stretching part of the yoga that's important. Yeah, so it's the getting getting into the zone is the important part. Maybe, or or one of seven other possibilities. Yoga really is complicated. So, for instance, if someone was doing a bunch of breathing with their with their yoga, that could be significant. I don't yeah. know. Yeah, look, Adrian's just made an interesting comment that I'm I'm going to half answer before I hand to you, Paul. But it's sure. let me just show. So, why at university were we? taught to get patients to stretch well because that's what we did um you know and I, I think the evidence has has been accumulating in recent years to ch change that and I, I think a lot gets taught because this is because we've always done it so i'll let you respond now paul <laughs> uh, because it's because it's well entrenched dogma and received wisdom uh, the american college of sports medicine um believes that flexibility is, quote, important in athletic performance and in the ability to carry out activities of daily living. It is, quote, a major component, unquote, of fitness. Uh, when you have major organizations like that that are publishing statements like that um, for decades, um, then it's going to be a part of your curriculum, whether it's true or not. Um, yeah. One of the weirdest things, for us, particularly for young clinicians to wrap their heads around, is just how much of conventional wisdom, how much of what's in the textbooks is just wrong, okay? you know, and it just, I, I, the older I get, the more compassionate I try to be about that. When I was younger, I was a lot more uh, scoffy, um, I was a lot more contemptuous of how much uh, dogma there is, uh, but it's hard. This field is hard. There's just an immense amount to learn about musculoskeletal medicine, and you, you literally can't learn it all in school, even if all of the textbooks were crammed with nothing but perfect information. And it's just a really difficult field, and I like to point out, still surprisingly primitive. We're, I, I think we're 50 years of good progress away from musculoskeletal medicine being truly evidence-based. Uh, we're we're a long way off. It's so the fact that there's bad information out there is not really at all surprising. Um, it's it's worse than you think. <laughs> it's pretty much what I tell all students. Whenever students start to get the impression that there might be something wrong with the information that they're getting, I I tend to tell them, yeah, and it's worse than you think. <laughs> Paul, before we start talking neurology, which was which was inevitable uh, with this sort yeah. of episode, um, yeah. one last thing that was on my list I had to ask, um, and and if we if I don't ask it now, it'll be too late. And that is um, for the people that are still stretching or still telling their patients to stretch, uh, the people that are still mm. very entrenched and, and got the beliefs there. There's that sub sub argument of well, you got to hold it for X amount of seconds for it to actually count. 
Um, you know, so you know, some you, you know, hold your stretch for ten seconds. I don't know if you hold it for less than thirty, then then you know the goal the apparatus, right? You know, uh, is there any uh, sort of overwhelming data to support any period of, of length of stretch uh, being favourable uh, over another? There really isn't, um, and and what you see in the literature and uh, and the texts is a lot of conflicting information based on what clearly amounts to educated guessing. Um, I've got three bullet points here uh, for my bottom line on this topic. No one really knows. A reasonable amount is probably good enough, and the returns probably diminish steadily as the dosage increases. So to repeat, yes, static stretching will increase range of motion for whatever that is worth. Exactly how much and what kind of stretching, um, it doesn't really seem to take. There's, there's, there's almost nothing that we really know about how it works or how the best way to do it is, except that if you're reasonably diligent, it'll probably happen. Uh, if you just keep going, it'll probably work out and you'll get some extra range of motion. Uh, but the, the details are, you know, there's absolutely no sign that there's a special way to stretch that works better than all the others. Great. Okay, so it's interesting actually. Just looking at the comments coming in, and some of the people here are commenting. I know, and some I don't. But it's interesting. I know you've had you will have had twenty years of this. Just by reading the the the, the sort of the language or the type of question, you can see the people that are genuinely asking inquisitive questions about this topic. You can see the people that are, are pushing back. That you, yeah. you you know you can. And I guess this is your experience with it. And I, and I forgot to ask you earlier, so I'm going to quickly ask you now. When people do push back. Not necessarily the hate mail, but you know the the the, the disagreements. Mm -hmm. What is the what is the strongest disagreement that comes your way, or is there ever a really well articulated disagreement, or is it just a, just a disagreement? Yeah, it, it feels like it feels like it's been quite a while since I've gotten constructive criticism on the article that that moved me. Um, it has happened. I you know it it's it it was never it still isn't a perfect article, and it, it never was. Uh, so I have changed my mind on things over the years and learned things, but not for a while. Uh, most of, you know, the most vociferous objections are, are typically on pretty well-trodden um, uh, themes that, you know, I can honestly dismiss pretty quickly. So, for example, you know, a lot of people are really overheated about the, the idea of their posture, uh, that they've got to have um, perfect posture in order to be safe in the world. And... And they believe that stretching and flexibility is a critical component in maintaining their posture because if they don't stretch, they'll be pulled out of shape. Um, this is a very strong theme. I've gotten many, many, many letters like this over the years. And, uh, and it's all, you know, it's all, in my opinion, it's all based on a bunch of bad premises. Um, so I haven't changed my mind on that one anytime uh, lately. Um, the other big one I've already mentioned is that I hear a lot of, yes, but my method is, is special and effective and better. Um, that's a really common theme. Um, nothing else popping to mind, Ian, sorry. Uh, there's, uh, uh, there are definitely themes in the, in the mail that I get, but yeah, there's no strong, there's no strong counter arguments I can think of very easily because there's no strong counter arguments. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> Probably. <laughs> Let me give you a, a scenario that we'll, as clinicians, regardless of our, our specialty, we'll have all had this this exact thing happen to us in clinic. We'll have heard these discussions and had these uh, interactions. Uh, an athlete or whoever it is in front of us uh, reports that they feel tight slash stiff slash sore. What, you know, right. insert subjective feeling here. Um, yeah. They tell us that they stretch and they tell us that that stretch is beneficial. That stretch makes them feel better. It gets rid of aforementioned tightness, soreness, stiffness. Um, a very real, you know, they're not lying to us, a very real sort of uh, outcome for them. Um, mm -hmm. what's, the, what's the potential mechanisms at play here? Mm -hmm. um, neurological sensory adaptation is a big one. Um, the, the mechanism of increasing range of motion is a hotly debated topic. Um, are we actually changing the tissue physically or are we uh, changing how we feel about being extended that far? Um, and, uh, and certainly it is entirely possible that the major reason that people feel different better after stretching is because they're adapting to it. Um, they're uncomfortable with the idea that they can only stretch so far without discomfort. Um, you know, they feel stiff, they feel tight, they try to stretch, they hit that wall and in their mind, um, right or wrong, uh, that's bad, it's uncomfortable. 
uh, want to be able to stretch further with less discomfort. And, uh, and oddly enough, if you stretch, you get used to it. And so you have less discomfort when you go that far. Um, so in a sense, they're solving their problem beautifully because they feel uncomfortable with how far they can stretch without discomfort. And then they can stretch further with less discomfort for whatever it's worth. And maybe it's intrinsically worthwhile to feel like you can stretch further with less discomfort. Um, the, the mechanism I strongly suspect is probably the adaptation. This is sensory adaptation. Uh, rather, rather than changing the muscle, which probably does happen, but probably also takes you know longer and more diligence, and and so almost all of that, I stretched and I felt better. Um, all of those anecdotes are more likely to be powered by that uh, short-term effect of adapting to a new sensory situation. Yeah, and Steve actually has just made a pretty solid comment, which is on similar lines, um, I think you can probably bring it up, Craig. I think we're changing our body's reaction mm -hmm. to an unfamiliar movement. So kind of yeah. what, you know, sort of what you right. were saying there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, it feels feels like the right time, even though it's not technically stretching, to, to just really quickly while we've got you, while we've got your critical mind here and to, to pick at it a little bit, to bring in the foam roller, the, uh, the, the sort oh, of, uh, the, you know, like- <laughs> let, me, let me get my can of worms. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> Just yeah. because we want to be okay. as controversial as possible and we want to upset as many people as possible. Um, <laughs> yes, we haven't upset enough people yet. Let's get exactly, to work. Yeah. Just, yeah. Uh, and I, by the way, I say this as someone who phone rolls, you know, all cards, yeah. all cards on the table, um, yeah. despite being familiar with the evidence base of it. Um, just I give bet us your you quick... stretch too. I must admit, I don't. I do not stretch. Oh, you don't? You actually got, don't? I haven't got time to do both, so I have to pick my favorite. And I just, <laughs> I find phone rolling, I'm a lazy person. Phone rolling is easier to yeah. do while I'm watching Netflix. So um, could you just right. give us your 60, your 60, 90 seconds appraisal of phone rolling um, and, and, and whether it's a similar vibe to kind of the stretching that we've been talking about? It is a similar vibe, yeah. <laughs> and the, the, the obvious commonality is that uh, it feels good and we're not sure what good it actually does. <laughs> so um, I, this is where I jump in and say, um, in case I haven't already, I do stretch and I foam roll. I like it, it feels good. Um, but I very much interpret that experience as you know, basically being like ritualized back scratching. I also scratch my back every day. Um, I have <laughs> a back scratcher, <laughs> I oh, use right. it. You've got and, so much free time, Paul, right? Well, we all have right now, right? <laughs> <laughs> so much time. I, it's like all I do. It's just, I write an article, I scratch my back. Um, <laughs> it's, I, I actually joke that, that, um, that when I use the, uh, the, the foam roller, um, it, I'm, I'm scratching my back. Um, and when I'm stretching, I'm scratching an itch that maybe I can't reach any other way, which by the way, is actually a fairly powerful analogy. Um, it, there, there might really be something to that, the scratching an itch you can't reach any other way. Um, but uh, the, the, whole, the whole foam roller thing is basically, uh, it's about massage, which is um, the most dominant topic on uh, painscience.com because of my background as a massage therapist. So I've thought and written a lot about that. There's a, there's a funny tendency to talk about foam rolling as though it's somehow different or um, special not massage. You know, it, the, 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 some, something about squishing yourself with a foam cylinder is different than massage. Not really. It, it's massage. <laughs> it's, it's a self-massage tool. So anything you have to say about uh, foam rollers is basically about you know, does massage therapy work? How does it work? What's that all about? And of course, that is a massive topic, Absolutely. which I've written much more about than stretching. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Before we before we bring it home and we, mm. we sort of get the summary, the, the, the take homes, just a really quick uh, comment, because I feel like we, we've been guilty of talking about patients, athletes, and, and rightly or wrongly, the impression may be that we've been talking about quote unquote, the normal, the normal population, so to yeah. speak. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah. I just want to quickly um, make comment to perhaps people that sit at uh, a, a sort of more polar extreme of the, whatever, what, let's call it the mobility spectrum. So the, the, very, the, the hypermobile 
and the hype homo mm -hmm. world um, and the, yeah. the people with cerebral palsy and things. Um, yeah. Is there any kind of anything you need to add with those? I don't want to call them, you know, specialist populations, but you know what I mean? Is there anything that we've said here that, that doesn't apply to those to those particular populations? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the hypermobile population is just a really interesting and important one for the stretching question, uh, because people uh, either don't know that they exist in the first place or don't understand the significance of their existence uh, when it comes to stretching. Um, it, y you don't need to look further than the hypermobile population uh, for, uh, for the pathologically hypermobile population. To, to understand that the belief that flexibility is a universal good for fitness has something wrong with it. Um, because there's really quite a lot of people running around out there who are pathologically flexible. They don't, not only do they not need to stretch, it's dangerous for them. And they have an extraordinarily, they have an extraordinary number of associated health problems. Um, that that family of pathologies is mostly genetic and it's weird stuff. Uh, the effects of these genes on connective tissue, we still don't understand. And a lot of these people can actually be harmed by stretching and are a pretty dramatic example of how being flexible is not inherently beneficial uh, because, I mean, they got it. I mean, they've got genes that make them more flexible. They are literally stretchier. Uh, for a, a variety of reasons, and it's hurting them, not helping them. It's very clearly a harmful pathology, uh, other than doing, you know, better stupid human tricks with your joints at parties when you're 18. Uh, there's really not a lot to recommend it, and a lot of these people end up with lots and lots of musculoskeletal problems later on in life. Uh, so that's the hype, that's the that's the hypermobile end of the spectrum. The hypomobile end of the spectrum is less pathological as far as I know. Um, but I don't know as much about that. Uh, maybe if someone in the, in the listeners knows about pathological hypermobility, a comment or a link would be interesting. Um, it's not, I haven't thought about that nearly as much. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'll pause yeah, there. Just gonna, um, it was just, just change the topic slightly earlier on there was a comment i apologize i haven't got it and not sure who it was from about that their achilles aches from time to time and they stretch it and makes them feel better um and we see a lot of i i, I my achilles aches I, I do a bit of a stretch but here's an earlier comment from adam which is um you know stretching is just another form of loading tissues just a low load option so yeah. you know may, maybe stretching in something like an achilles tendinopathy is more a loading related issue rather than a stretching flexibility issue. But then I take the comment about it, it's a low load option. Yeah, yeah, I, and, and I agree with that. Um, you know, the, the tendon doesn't really know whether you're lifting a weight or or pulling on it with a static stretch. It's, it's all the same to the tendon. Mm. Uh, it's not the same to the muscle, obviously, but it's the same mm. to a bunch of the muscle tendinous unit. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there, I believe there's some evidence that even just a brief isometric loading will uh, reduce pain. So mm -hmm. I, I suspect yeah. it's another adaptation effect. It's another uh, sensory adaptation effect. I have Achilles tendonitis. I've had it for 15 years as an ultimate player. I've battled it constantly. I suspect my Achilles tendons look pretty bad under a microscope. Uh, so I've done a tremendous amount of stretching and rehab and and uh, I've, I've tried, I've tried it all. And, uh, and I agree, my tendons do feel better when I stretch. I can reproduce that effect. Uh, my sore tendons, I could go stretch them right now and they would feel better, uh, but it doesn't last. And I, I haven't noticed any, ever any lasting effect. So I t suspect that it's mostly just a short-term sensory adaptation to loading. Sure. Now, in, in, in a number of comments, we've had the word PNF dropped a few times. I just really mm -hmm. want to make any comment on that. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's the primary example, proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitation. Um, it's the primary example of fancy stretching, of allegedly advanced. I just, uh, I just went to that spot in my article. Uh, it's really nothing fancy. CR just adds contraction, doesn't increase flexibility any more than static stretching. Yeah, I I've, uh, I, I got asked about PNF um, so much uh, 10 years ago 
but <laughs> I did a bunch of work on it and learning about it. And I haven't honestly thought about it much since then. I basically was like, oh, well, there's, n there's nothing much to, to look at here. And I haven't thought about it a great deal since. Uh, but I'm always open to a citation. If someone wants to send me evidence that PNF is great, I will look. Absolutely. Because you're a scientist. So um, we're approaching the hour. Now, for someone who hasn't um, been on your website before, and, I, and I'll, I'll implore them again to, to do so. But for those that haven't, aren't yet familiar with your website, what they'll find is when they go on there and they look at um, any given um, article, usually you think, oh, my goodness, you scroll down. First thing you do when you see an article, you scroll all the way down, see how, how long is this thing? How much, have I got time to read it now? You think, yeah. Jesus, <laughs> you don't have time thing, to read anything on my website, thing, I promise. This is a piece of 20,000 words. But there's a little, uh, just under the title there, there's a little um, box that says show summary. And if you yeah. sort of, if you hover over it, Craig, the show summary. Um, don't, I, I don't think I can do that on the... Oh, you can do that, okay. Context, oh. yeah. So go to the oh, website. No, there you go. Yeah. And what it basically gives you is the the the, uh, the sort of the it's like if you're reading an article, but you just read the abstract basically. Um, and I think that's a lovely thing. I, not that I think people should just read summaries, but if this episode was was one of your articles and we're rounding it up now, could you just give us your your summary of of stretching? What are the real take homes for people that maybe uh, have? turned on this video after the fact they've seen it's an hour long and they've scrolled right to 59 minutes this is your <laughs> given the well let me see if only if only i had a convenient summary of of this <laughs> 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 stretching just doesn't have the effects that most people hope it does <laughs> um read read the summary it's um the i think the main thing that i want people to to take away is that it's just fine to stretch if it feels good by all means don't want to hurt your buzz do it integrate it with other interesting things if that uh, tosses your confetti like yoga meditation but in general just can we please dial down the importance of it it's um I am not advocating to eliminate all stretching from rehab um, or from athletics, but I do think that it needs a demotion. It needs to be toned down. And in particular, I just hate to see people obsessing over their flexibility, sweating, the fact that they're not doing it enough. It's uh, There probably are benefits of stretching. I'm I'm betting that there are some that we haven't uh, yet confirmed with evidence, uh, but I doubt they're very, I doubt they're a big deal. And so mostly I just really want people to not feel like they are under pressure to stretch, like they're neglecting their fitness. And especially I don't want people to think that they're in any kind of trouble or risk because they're not stretching. Uh, so, for instance, ideas like if I don't stretch out my asymmetries, my posture will be bad and my head will explode. Um, please, no, it won't. <laughs> None of this stuff is important enough to spend time on. There's a bunch of other stuff. Get, go do some strengthening. Go for a run. Almost anything else in the world of fitness and exercise is probably a better investment of your time. Doesn't mean stretching is useless, <laughs> but... It does mean that other stuff is almost certainly more useful. Beautiful. Okay, Beautiful. look, thanks, thanks so much, Paul. The, the hour's Thank gone you. so qu quickly. Um, it has. They always do. But I, I do have one final question, totally unrelated to this topic of stretching, more to do um, with massage. And I might actually edit this bit out of the, the YouTube <laughs> version because we okay. go, over, go, go over the hour. But, it's not, but I, I, I got some abuse held at me um, a few weeks ago um, commenting on a comment that a massage therapist had mate so i'm calling on your background in that and they, they made the comment about massage increasing blood flow to the area and i said no it doesn't yeah. um and i just wonder if you just comment on that <laughs> well i have a whole big article about that it's got a summary at the top and the uh, the the most important take-home message about circulation increasing in massage is that it's generally recommended very reflexively with a very poor understanding of what it actually means or how you would measure that um, and in general most of the ways that you would measure it it ain't true um, and what really moves blood what really increases circulation in a, in a meaningful practical way is wait for it 
Exercise. It's <laughs> it's such a no-brainer. Any any effect of massage or practically anything else on circulation is basically dwarfed by what you'll get from metabolic demand from running up and down a few flights of stairs. Um, so it's my, my former colleagues in massage therapy, they just love to claim that. And it's, it's really, honestly, it's just a very careless, casual, informal, my work has biological benefits. See, um, it's not a very examined belief. And when you examine it, it falls apart. Okay. Look, th thanks so much, Paul. The hour's gone really, really quickly. We've had lots of people watching, lots of comment. This is our first try at this new platform. I actually think it's worked very, very really well. So look, thanks again. Yeah, it's, good. it's been thanks, well worth Paul. it. Really appreciate it. Great. Everybody, thank you for watching me wear a potted plant on my head for the last hour. <laughs>